I would take it. Stepping uh, <laughs> first. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, what are the things you're flashing again? Sorry. You so it's going to be a, a, just a five at eight, after eight minutes. Right. And then one after 12 minutes. Okay. And you really want just to stop. <laughs> well, you, I mean, it's, you're supposed to speak for 13 minutes. I think the session is 15. So I end up going all the way from 15 on stand up. Okay. Um, but we'll try and write on, uh, write on uh, the schedule. There's also a uh, pointer here for you guys. Okay, we might as well get going here. Uh, so welcome to uh, Evolutionary Ecology, Community, Communities and Interactions. Uh, I'm Ron Bassett, I'll be chairing this session today. And our first speaker is um, Simon Elliott, who's gonna be filling in for Claudine, um, who's ill. Let's see. Yeah, sure. Do this now. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, so I, I'm, I'm Sam Elliott. I'm sub substituting for Claudine Carvalho. We're both at the same university in Brazil, Federal University, which is one of the main uh, agricultural universities in the country. Uh, and this talk is Experimental Evolution Towards Low Virulence. So it fits in with evolution of virulence. In the middle, there's a bit that's 
a bit more molecular. The original title says a detailed molecular analysis, but I think in 10 minutes that's not possible. Um, to introduce the theory, started with Anderson and May, basic epidemiological theory, uh, where you, what, what happens is you have a trade-off between virulence and transmission. For anyone who's not up on this theory, uh, a very useful review is this one by Alison and Minus van Balen from 2009, and this figure is from that. And you'll probably recognize the figure as optimal foraging, basically. It's optimal foraging, but you just change the axes. Uh, so this is this here would from here to here would be virulence mortality caused by the pathogen, and this is trade-off with transmission. And there's some optimum, not at the not low, not zero virulence and not maximal virulence, but somewhere in the middle. There's this. This has been the subject of a number of experimental evolution studies, uh, Daphne and all sorts of things. Of course, E. coli and bacteriophage and so on. But often the mechanisms are not very well understood or just assumed, it's just assumed there's this selection and the organisms can respond. Uh, then what happens if you have a biological invasion or a new association between host and parasite? Well, it's going to end up somewhere not at the optimum, probably. So it could be too low. If it's too low, then you probably won't even notice that there's a pathogen there. There's if it's too high, then you may have an emergent disease. It may be this big problem like Ebola or HIV or whatever. So in principle, high virulence here is maladaptive, and you'd expect selection towards, back towards this optimum. A classic example is the myxomatosis virus, which was taken from Uruguay, where it was considered benign in quotes. Uh, and it was introduced to kill. That's very difficult to assess, of course, without proper study. Uh, it was taken to uh, control the European rabbit, which is a different host in Europe and Australia, and here are the picture. I think most people know the basic situation. But its virulence was very high at the beginning. That's why it was taken for its classical biocontrol. And it killed practically, well, almost all of the rabbits in Australia. Frank Fenner, an Australian virologist, documented this during several decades. So it really is a classic study, one of these long-term ecological evolutionary studies, and showed that with time, the virulence gradually went down. At some point, it started going back up again, but that's a, you can have a look here and um, other, other studies. I think the strains are still available. People are still studying this system. So the system we're looking at today is another virus, cowpea mild mottle virus. It was originally reported from cowpea in Ghana. And I'll just quickly show this spread. When it goes red, then it's infecting soybean, which is the host we're considering today spreading across the world, getting to Brazil in 83, infecting common bean, and then soybean in 2001, and continuing to spread across the world, so especially in central latitudes. In Brazil, it was first reported 16 years ago in the center west, Goiás. We're here, by the way, that's where we are. There's Rio, Sao Paulo, just so you can situate yourselves, um, and spreading across the country, especially the central area, which was so largely, Cejado has been turned into cultivation, including soybean as one of the main grain crops. Now it's all over the country. I think that should be filled in as well. Uh, that's the virus. <clears throat> it's a small virus. A lot of plant viruses are small because they have to get through the plasma desmata. <clears throat> so this is 20 times smaller than the myxoma virus. Uh, it's a Kala virus, RNA, positive RNA. And this is its genome, and there are one, two, what, three, four, five, six, six or so basically genes. And this is the one we're considering most today. This is the one that controls replication within the host cell, so the RDRP replication here. Uh, it's transmitted by white fly, non-persistent, so it doesn't have that intimate association with the vector. It doesn't, it doesn't reproduce in the vector. <coughs> Symptoms in the field, it was originally reported as this very severe disease in soybeans, so you can, you're going to get no production here. You've got stem necrosis. You can imagine what stem necrosis does to a plant, and especially its productivity at the end. And we're considering particularly stem necrosis here. And then there's this observation from the lab, because you obviously take it to the lab and you're, 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 you can freeze it, but you also 
do these serial passages so you can bring it out and study it. And with, sub sub with successive inoculations, this necrosis turns into a, um, <clears throat> mosaic symptoms, which is much less severe. So this virulence, it seems to be reducing. So what the group in plant pathology that I'm representing here did was to take three line lineages here from the same isolate, but separated into three lineages, and then do these serial passages where a number of uh, plants were infected, and each, each generation these were all pulled and used to infect the next generation by mechanical inoculation. Three lineages, and this is what is observed. Again, this change to mosaic symptoms. The ones not filled in are no infection and no, so confirmed by ELISA, I think. Um, but the ones that, that are dark are necrosis. So it's necrosis, necrosis, necrosis. And then all of a sudden in the sixth passage, fifth or sixth, you get the appearance of these mosaic symptoms in all three lineages, only one necrotic here. Uh, as a subsequent experiment, to understand it a bit better, this was a bottleneck experiment. So a different plant, Nicotiana, which is not a, such a good host, was used, and the, the virus only causes local lesions. They don't spread across the plant. So you have a very small population, which can be used as a bottleneck. So that was used then. Again, three lineages. And the experiment didn't even get to the stage of <clears throat> six passages and so on, because already by the second passage, the symptoms changed, and these, these were not infected, so that becomes only this lot. But again, the symptoms changed much more quickly with this much smaller population of the pathogen. So what we have is this switch from high virulence, which is necrosis, to these other, this low virulence, which is mosaic. And it seems to be a switch more than a gradual change. Sudden in the sixth passage or in the second, in the second experiment. So then comes the, here, the mechanisms with this virus, because it's much smaller than a myxoma virus, for example, or if you imagine some prokaryote or eukaryotic pathogen or parasite, you can sequence the whole genome. And so the whole, all, all, of the virus, all of the virus population was sequenced from first, third, and sixth passages and the first and the second in this experiment. <clears throat> and that allows several, several analyses to be made. One is the phylogenetic analyses. And here's looking at that first off, the, the repl replication part. And it shows that this clustering, you can't see the details here, but one cluster is the sixth passage, where it's necrotic, and the other, pa the other cluster is all the rest beforehand. So you have this very clear uh, separation in both experiments. So this is the first experiment and the second experiment. This is this. These are the necrotic isolates, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Meanwhile, all of the other orbs, there's no pattern at all. So it doesn't seem to be much going on in the other orbs. Uh, this then becomes a bit difficult to see, but you can get a lot of population genetic measures. Perhaps the most visible here is the number of mutations, which you can clearly see is much greater for the first orb th throughout the experiment. So there's a lot more going on in this first experiment. And this is also 10 times, these three cells are 10 times greater than all of the rest. So that's for the, the, all these other measures, so nucleotide, nucleotide diversity, uh, Watterson's EPS estimate, and so on. Recombination, then, another analysis. Looking for recombination sites, <clears throat> a number of them mapped here in that first ORF, here in the second experiment, but none detected in ORFs two to six, not shown here, because there's nothing to show. Just continuing with the mechanisms and going out slightly, whoever knows a bit about plant pathology will have heard of the hypersensitive response when you see a leaf in the field with these little little dots. Often that is where a pathogen is infected and the cells have died around it, which is a defense mechanism. And this shows that before the, that switch, this uh, reactive oxygen species that kill the cells are around, and here they're not. And then this is just um, showing uh, a quantitative, quantitative PCR of certain genes here, gene expression. So at the beginning of the biochemical chain, these, there's no difference here. But somewhere in the middle of the biochemical chain of the hypersensitive response, there is this down regulation. 
and that's for subsequent study, naturally. So that's what we've got here. It seems that ORF1 is the main culprit for these changes in virulence, these three sets of evidence, and here's a bit of uh, more biological <coughs> mechanisms. And then this is the bit where I'm more involved because I'm the entomologist here. Oh, no, it's the next bit, sorry. But this is, this is also qPCR of the amount of virus. So the amount of virus in the um, mosaic strain after it's switched is much higher than beforehand when it's necrotic high virulence. So it's reproducing less. This is then survival of whitefly on, on plants infected with those isolates. Where it's mosaic, survival of the whitefly is normal compared with the control. Is, I can't even remember which is the control. This is the control here. So this infected one is even better. It's not actually. But, but where it's necrotic, the whitefly, of course, are not surviving because there's no leaf tissue. <clears throat> So this low virulence is associated with higher fitness, just like in the virulence transmission trade-off. Um, so to conclude, higher virulence seems to be maladaptive because you've got lower fitness, both in terms of virus replica replication and in terms of survival of the vector. And it seems to be associated with a particular region of the genome and where the initial expectation was a set of mutations which would gradually change here we have a switch, um, and it may well be able to switch back, and this may actually reflect changing hosts. It may be that if it gets into a different host, it will change. So this may be down to local host adaptation, but it certainly seems that in this particular cultivar of the parasite that it's, uh, that's what's going on. So there's me there. Um, this is mostly the work of PhD student Larissa here, who should be finishing the end of this year. And there's my wife's email to, if you want to get in touch with her. I'm part, I did the entomology part, as I said. Okay? Thanks very much. We've got a few minutes for questions. a good question and I'm not sure I know how to answer it, I'm afraid. Sorry. few minutes here. See where we're at. If I can find the there we go. Counts, right? Yeah. Let's see, and then control All right, so next up we have Sean Kautz uh, from the University of Sheffield. Uh, hello, everyone. So in the sort of middle of the 20th century, so around the sort of 1940s, 1950s, the world started using chemical tools in a big way. Pesticides, herbicides, uh, antibiotics, because they were incredibly effective and they were relatively cheap for what they did. And they became a huge part of, they've become still a huge part of our food production systems and um, our, our human efforts for human health. And of course, because they're so effective, they're, they're really imposing a strong selection pressure on whatever populations they're put, under, put, put onto. And so they're really a good example of like rapid evolution that we can sort of measure and see. And the result of all of this is basically what you see in the picture here. So on the picture, 
You see down the side, there's some, uh, these three over here. These, these, are, these are not exposed to herbicides, so these are uh, black grass, it's just a, a weed in, in the UK. And all these other pots, they were exposed to some herbicide. And the ones in the middle, they're coming from a field where, where there's resistance, and you can see essentially the herbicide was basically useless. And this is a problem because this particular grass exists just about any, everywhere in the southern UK. Um, and this is one of the most productive wheat growing areas just about anywhere in the world. And uh, the, the basic problem is this. So this is a picture, this is my colleague Helen here and uh, Kirsty, and they're out in the field measuring some black grass density. And just about everything you can see in that picture is black grass. Although they are in fact standing in a wheat field. And if you look real careful, like here, there's a bit of wheat. Now if you're the farmer, that's a real problem because you're not getting a lot of money from that. And typically what farmers will do is they'll just pour a lot of herbicide on it. But as we saw before, that doesn't really work anymore because you've got resistance. And so what I'm doing is I've, I've tried to model and understand how this resistance is working in a bit more detail using this black grass example because we have a lot of data for it. And so basically there's two main types of resistance that we sort of understand. So the first type we've understood for a long time and that's called target site resistance. And there's basically a mutation in one of the one, typically one gene, and it changes the uh, protein, the binding protein, where the poison binds, and it might make it, let's say, narrow, and so the poison can no longer bind to it. And it basically renders it, it, it completely ineffective. And it also typically has really low, like, demographic costs. So the plant doesn't, it doesn't affect the performance of the resistant individual all that much, as far as we can tell, in a lot of cases. We understand that pretty well. Is the second type that we don't understand nearly so well is called uh, quantitative resistance or metabolic resistance or non-target site resistance. They're all sort of words for the same thing, which is basically, so that's one gene. And this is like, think of lots of genes. So there might be hundreds or thousands of genes. And they're all having a little effect. So these might be things like they metabolize the poison. They might transport the poison away from the binding site. Um, we had the example this morning in the plenary about the thicker cuticles and bed bugs. All of these things sort of to stop the poison working. And they'll have little additive effects. And that means this trait is actually continuous resistance. So the basic difference for the rest of this talk I want you to keep in mind is target site resistance is a binary trait. You either have it or you don't. And it basically follows sort of Mendelian inheritance. Quantitative resistance or metabolic resistance is a continuous trait. Everyone in the population has some value for um, quantitative resistance. It's just that value might be very low. So phenotypically, they are um, susceptible. And so what we would expect is that uh, the target site resistance, being basically cost-free and really effective, is going to basically push the non-target site resistance out of the population. Because the non-target site resistance is more costly and it's typically not as effective. But we see, starting to see lots of some examples where actually we see these two sort of modes of resistance existing in the same population. So we see it in black grass. We're also starting to see it in some <coughs> mosquito populations that get a lot of pyrethroids poured onto them to control diseases like dengue and um, malaria. And we see it in a, some sort of horticultural pest. So this caterpillar here is an important horticultural pest. And we see both of these modes of resistance. And so the question is sort of how? Because they're basically both doing the same job. So why do you have two things doing the same job in the same population when one is better than the other? And so I created a model. There's quite a lot going on here, so I'll go through it kind of slow. Um, <coughs> we have these locations, x1, x2, x3. <coughs> And so the, the model is spatially explicit. It's a, a one-dimensional landscape. And at each location on that landscape, we have another dimension, which is our resistance score, our, our continuous non-target site resistance score. So our population is, has a distribution over that. So in this case, a normal distribution. And at each location, it has three of these normal distributions. So for the um, target site resistant, target site resistant heterozygote, um, and target site susceptible. 
And so then we so we have a seed bank, so this plant's an annual grass, so it has a seed bank. Seed bank uh, emerges, comes up out of the ground, gets some herbicide poured on it, things die or live depending on their genotype. And then those survivors become parent distributions. And so they disperse pollen, and then so they all they all breed with each other, mixing up the genes. And then those seed, those genes then get spatially dispersed, both in the pollen but also in the seeds. So those seeds travel across the landscape under a different much narrower kernel. And then those seeds are also, you have, you have a mixing both of the target site resistance at the top here, so you have basically every mix from every cross, but also including in that you have the mixing across the distributions within, within those target site genotypes, genes. Yep. And so basically we run that forward, we solve it numerically, and what do we find? So remember I said this was a one, one run on a one dimensional landscape? So that's basically this x-axis here. So this, this is like, and then time is along, oh sorry, x, on the y-axis, time is along the x-axis. So these are basically like snapshots through time for every time step in the, that the model is run. And then at the top here, we have percent R, we have survival, RR. So they're basically measures of both target site resistance and quantitative resistance. So percent R is just the frequency of the target site resistant allele in the population. When that is red, there's a lot of it. Target site resistance is important. Um, survival RR, so that's the survival of susceptible target site susceptible individuals. So when that's red, that means there's lots of meta metabolic or um, quantitative resistance. And then what we see above the black line there, that's where our target site resistant population started. So we have our target site resistance alleles up above the back black line, and it's invading down into the area below that black line. And then you can see that basically the plots look very different depending on whether you're invading into an empty landscape on the top row or a full landscape on the bottom row. So whether you're invading it, so the population on the bottom row, there's already plants there, there's already some black grass plants there in the population. They just don't have target site alleles in them. And so you can see what happens basically in the top row in the empty population, it's getting herbicide put on it every year. So target site, the target site resistance alleles become more prevalent in the um, population. And then those, those target site sort of resistant individuals, they basically ride the ecological invasion out to take over the whole landscape and become very prevalent. And the other one you see, uh, the bottom one, when it's invading into the full landscape, the herbicide has been put on the whole landscape the whole time. Target site resistance, again, develops above the line here, so you get lots of red above the line in the first plot. But that spreads out much more slowly into the rest of the population. And that's because you can see in the second plot, this you get a lot of quantitative resistance. Early on it develops very fast, and so that's breaking down the selection selective pressure so that will help that's driving the target site resistant alleles. And you can see in the, the sort of purple region on the last one, I just multiply the two together. And so that's the sort of region in the landscape where you get both, or the time and place where you get both at the same time. And you see that is actually because this invasion is so slow, this is actually relatively stable. It's moving and it will eventually, eventually you'll get target site resistance in the whole population. I mean that's the end equilibrium state of this system as you only have the most efficient one. But it's going to take a very long time to get there. So that's one parameter combination. Um, but obviously this, this effect is essentially going to change depending on what sort of parameters you put in the model. And so one of the most important ones is this thing called a protective effect of non-TSR. So it's basically this row thing. It, that is just how higher numbers um, means that an individual with a higher, uh, higher um, quantitative resistance score, that continuous resistance score, has more, has higher survival. And at zero down here, basically, quantitative resistance is useless. You get no effect from having a high quantitative resistance score. And so we have and you see there's sort of <coughs> blocks of two here. So the top one again is target site resistance and the bottom one is uh, quantitative <coughs> resistance, so percent R survival RR. And then the four different blocks, uh, so TSR low, TSR high, they are like, imagine there's a field of wheat and a farmer comes along with his tractor from a different field and drops a bunch of seeds. It's a pretty common occurrence for these sorts of agricultural weeds. Those refer to the 
the uh, genetic structure of the source population of those seeds. So those, those seeds came from somewhere. So those seeds are going to have their own genetic history and their own sort of management history. And that's going to drive what their genetic structure is. So we could have a high frequency of target site resistant alleles or a low frequency, so that's in the columns. Or we could also, and we could also have high, they could have low quantitative resistance and, or high quantitative resistance. And so we get the four sort of combinations. So the blue lines here show you what happens when those seeds get dropped into a landscape that already had flat grass. And what you get is basically the same thing regardless of the source, the genetic structure of the source of those seeds, which is that when you have high target site resistance, so for, for this parameter value, you get high target site resistance, you'll get low, you'll get low metabolic resistance. For parameter values where you get low target site resistance, you'll get high quantitative resistance. So it's essentially just switching. They are, you, you either have one or the other basically with a very sort of narrow parameter space here in the middle where you'll get both. When it's invading into an empty landscape however, you get a huge variety of different things happening. So in some cases you get uh, in the top one there you can see basically you get you always have quite high target site resistance but um, the quantitative resistance starts to come up, but really, when it's really effective, it will start to come up at quite high numbers. Or you have basically the situation where you never get target site, you never get uh, non-target site resistance. So target site, it's always target site resistance that's doing it. Or you get situations where basically you get, um, tar you get it sort of swaps. So like in this one here, where it's either it's either high target site resistance and low metabolic resistance or the other way around, but it actually happens very slowly, so you end up with quite a lot of parameter space where you're getting both things existing at the same time in the landscape. Or you get one, again, where it's always high and this starts, and the, the target site resistance is always higher. You start getting quantitative resistance that comes up, and it's, again, you can see a lot of overlap. So what does this all mean? Basically, it shows that the ecological context of which both where the seeds are coming from and where they land has a big effect on where you get both of these things existing in the landscape. And this is particularly true when we saw um, seeds going into like empty spaces. And this is sort of a situation you expect to see like on the invasion front and invading into new areas. So we think a lot of this sort of, perhaps it's not surprising then that we see a lot of, gene a lot of like genetic heterogeneity in these two modes of existence across the landscape. Because this stuff is going to be happening all the time, all over the landscape in different ways. And we show that sort of it, that, that drives these sort of differences in how, how we get to the same endpoint of resistance. Thanks. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions for Sean. Uh, are they, are they costs or are assumptions about costs? We are making assumptions about costs. And we so we tested, is uh, being a sensitivity now. So along with this parameter, cost is the other big one that drives it. But these two sort of things interact. So if you have a better protective effect, you can have a higher cost, basically. In the, in the real world, the costs are thought to exist, but be relatively low. Um, but I, I think it basically changes species to species. In this species, you don't see a lot of cost. It seems to be some sort of maybe reduction in fecundity, but it's actually pretty hard to pick up unless you've got like a lot of a lot of plants, so it's not particularly cheap. Maybe time for one more. Yeah. Uh, we're assuming target site resistance is cost free in this. Right, but if you have both. Yeah. You have so you only you, you only ever have the quantitative resistance cost. There's no cost of having target site resistance. No, I, I meant is it is the plant more resistant to the herbicide if you've got both? Ah, uh, no, no both it's both one or the other because the mechanisms of resistance. Ah, uh, yeah, because so you basically <coughs> uh, you we are assuming basically also target site resistance is perfect. So it's, it's zero cost and it's perfect resistance. So once you get to 100% survival, I mean you can't just go, you can't go further than that. So no, I guess.
Great. We're going to have to cut it off there. Thanks, Thanks again. Great. Next up, we have Megan Sorensen from the University of York. Great. Good morning. Um, I'm talking about symbiote variation and host choice in a microbial photosymbiosis. Um, so many of the most important transitions in evolution occurred when organisms interact and depend on one, each, on one another in the environment. So in the first instance, this would be a symbiosis, and if one of the organisms lives within the other, it becomes an endosymbiosis that has a higher level of physical integration. And in a few very rare instances, this integration increases to the extent that one of the organisms loses its autonomy and it becomes an organelle. Now, these important evolutionary transitions can be difficult to study because often we're left with only the end products as opposed to having intermediates with which we can study. So this project is looking at the establishment and transition to endosymbiosis for both its evolutionary importance and its ecological importance. So this figure shows the distribution of very established plastid endosymbioses throughout the eukaryotic tree. And as you can see, they're very well distributed and occur um, many times outside of a sort of classical example within the land plants. And these are just the stable examples. So there are far more times when the relationships are facultative and fluid, and therefore will sort of change and their presence will alter depending on environmental conditions that affect whether or not these are beneficial or not. Um, so looking at endosymbiosis, we used the system Paramecium versere, which is a ciliate and has a green algae symbiont chlorella. They have a facultative endosymbiosis, meaning that the two organisms can still be separated and survive, but naturally they almost always occur together um, and have a high level of integration so that they show vertical transmission as well as uh, synchronization of their circadian cycles. Um, it's thought to primarily rely on a nutrient exchange and in that it's a sort of classical photosymbiosis where the photosize Photosynthesizing green algae can provide fixed carbon in the form of maltose, maltose and exchange for nitrogen that the host gets from bacteria. This means that the host has to continue feeding on bacteria regardless of the fact that it becomes symbiotic. Because you can separate the organisms, we can stop and essentially restart the relationship. So you can take symbiotic um, cells and cure them completely of their symbionts so that they're sort of clear and then reinfect and introduce the symbionts again. Um, notice, does it, it doesn't work. Okay, or not. Um, you'll notice that the symbionts are partitioned and placed within the cell. So they're partitioned right against the wall of the cortex and it's sort of reminiscent of chloroplast positioning in a sort of plant cell. Um, and that you can see in the reestablishment, there's a, a f sort of phase in which they don't have to show this partitioning. And that means they're just in the normal digestive system of the host. And then they're sort of at a stage, they get separated from this and go to the cortex of the cell. So this is where it's believed that um, a potential recognition s step could occur. So using this system, um, I performed a reinfection experiment where one host line was taken, cured of its symbionts, and then split into three different cases where three different symbionts were reintroduced. So this was its native symbiont, so just isolated from the host. Um, a free-living chlorella, so this has never been symbiotic. And then a lab strain of chlorella that was symbiotic 48 years ago but since then has been in continuous culturing, and so we'd expect it to diverge quite a lot from the recently symbiotic chlorella. 
um, use flow cytometry to follow this experiment. Um, so what it can do is you get single cell level um, fluorescence measures, and you can therefore use cell size and uh, chlorophyll fluorescence measures to separate the cells you have. So this means we can get um, quantify the numbers of symbionts, hosts that are cured, as well as hosts that are symbiotic, because we can see that they have fluorescence within their cells. The results of this was a clear re-establishment with the native symbiont, so it increased its fluorescence um, back up to the sort of established <laughs> levels. Very inter interestingly, it did still take a significant amount of time. So it takes 50 days before it's sort of at a steady, sort of normal level, and 10 days before you even see a significant increase in fluorescence. Um, we believe is indicative of it not just sort of opening essentially to floodgates and letting everything in, but of it selecting one, maybe two symbionts, and then letting these cells grow up in its, um, to repopulate it, so that it sort of wants a bottlenecking of its symbionts. The free-living chlorella does show no increase in fluorescence and therefore does not re-establish with the host. But interestingly, the lab strain, so that's the one at the middle panel, does eventually show increases in fluorescence. Um, so it does seem that it has the capability to be recognized, but, some, but because of its the long time since it's been symbiotic, this takes far longer to come out and the establishment takes a lot longer. So this is population level dynamics, and you can also look at, so within a replica, you can see the dynamics again. And the interesting thing here is to note that in the native symbionts, so that's the panel on the right, um, <coughs> not all cells increase at the same level. So in the intermediate stages, you have a bimodal population in which some cells have increased their fluorescence and have symbionts but other cells aren't and still remain at a low level of fluorescence. Um, and then for the free living, the low level just remains. And for some of the replicates within the lab strain, you also see this increase, but for some you don't. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so having seen sort of compatibility differences between chlorella strains, we then looked whether there would be differences within those that have been symbiotic. So performing a similar reinfection experiment, um, this time in two different host backgrounds, um, but with six different Corella species, but these had all recently been symbiotic. So these are all recently isolated from paramecium hosts. And here we can see in the 186 paramecium background, its native symbiont does significantly better than all the others. And here, what we're using as a sort of measure of better is the fluorescence again, and this would be a, a proxy for both symbiont number and the sort of the activity of the symbionts within the cell. Um, so most of the other chlorella within 186 do similarly, except for the HK1 background, which performs significantly worse than the others. Um, but within the HK1 background, HK1 does not perform worse, but also doesn't perform better. And perhaps as the native symbiont, that would be what we'd assume. Um, in the HK1 background, a different chlorella, uh, DD1, sort of performs significantly worse. I also apologize that one of them is missing, but the data's collection is still occurring. So that will be filled in. Um, but it sort of shows that there's a significant interaction with the paramecium host, as well as the chlorella and that both matter. So some combinations do better and some combinations do worse, but it matters on both the host side and the symbiont side, which is indicative of co-adaptation having occurred between these strains, which is why some of them sort of have high levels and compatibility, whereas others don't. And interestingly, what might be behind the 186 um, behavior is that it is the most geographically different to the others. So um, 186 is a UK strain, while the rest are Japanese strains. So it has sort of, it's very likely that it would be quite highly diverged between the two sets. So having seen different sort of combinational effects of the symbiotic chlorella, we asked whether this might be due to differences in their metabolism. 
And so the first thing we looked at was whether their nitrogen metabolism would differ, as this is how they interact with the host. So um, a series of chlorella were grown on different nitrogen sources. So this is both, again, the free living, the lab strain, and a few different symbiotic strains of chlorella. Um, and both the strains and the nitrogen were found to be a significant interaction. And they sort of subtly vary in which sources they grow better on. Though in all cases, the amino acids do lead to higher growth rate, which is what we would expect. Interesting that lab strain, so that's the X symbiotic strain, has a very similar profile to some of the symbiotic strains. So though it does seem to have differences in its reestablishment, this seems unconnected to its sort of nitrogen metabolism. But also, it's within the symbiotic strains we do see variation. So in particular, DD1 has a very different profile to the others, preferring um, serine as its best amino acid compared to the others which prefer either glutamate or arginine. Um, so it does also seem that there are slight differences within the symbiotic chlorella. Um, and the free living um, has a fairly different profile to the rest of them. And if you look at the relative difference between the growth rates on the amino acids compared to the inorganic sources, it does relatively better with the inorganic sources, which is what we would expect from um, a chlorella that was used to living in the sort of minimal environment. So these do have subtle differences, but of course at this stage it's unconnected to whether these may or may not be uh, related to the differences in phenotypes seen in symbiosis. So what I want to achieve with further work is to follow up on this and see whether these differences in metabolism relate to differences within the actual symbioses. So to conclude, the um, host compatibility seems very dependent on the evolutionary history of the chlorella. Whether or not they've been symbiotic in the past seems the most important factor for whether or not the relationship will re-establish. So it does seem like there was a key development um, within the symbiotic algae that allowed them to be recognized and separated from the digestive process in the host. But since then, co-adaptation has happened within the strains, which is why we see differences between the combinations with both host and symbiont affecting the relationship. And these differences may or may not be related to metabolism, and I hope to follow up on that. Um, so I'd like to thank my supervisors, Mike Brockhurst, Duncan Cameron, and Jamie Wood, as well as the research group and funding bodies, in particular, Ewan Minter and Andrew Dean are talking in this session, so you'll be glad to hear there's more paramecium coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, do the hosts do as well? You see if they can survive without the yeah. little algae. But did it like, do they do as well without them? Do they grow as fast? And uh, their growth rate is normally slower, but it's also very dependent on sort of the light conditions, and you'll see some of that in the next talk. Yeah. It's a related question, but in the slide with specificity for the symbiotic strains. Yeah. What is the, those differences don't seem like they're very big in terms of fluorescence or significance, but what do they mean for growth and performance in the lab um, Do you mean in the combinational crossing? When, when Yeah. Um, so yeah, as one eight six one eight six is high. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't yet related it to changes in growth rates, but that's going to be something that we'd like to do as well. Yeah. So currently it's just approximate level, but it you it should it expect it to also follow with um, differences in growth rates. Um, but yeah, the the bars aren't necessarily sort of show that much difference, but they probably will affect in some way how they sort of act. Great. Thank you, Megan.
Okay, next up we have Ewan Minter from the University of York Hospital. Thanks very much. Hi, so I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about the same system uh, which Megan has been talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about intraspecific variation uh, in the sort of host symbiont combinations. Um, just like to take a look at quick look at this micrograph, uh, which is quite beautiful, and it's just a reminder that these things are mixotrophic organisms, so they rely on both the heterotrophic acquisition of nutrients as well as um, being supplemented by this uh, photosynthetically acquired carbon. Um, so we're really interested in these kinds of organisms and these kinds of associations, especially photosynthetic endosymbioses, because they have a really uh, great ecological importance. You think the coral reefs, uh, as you can see up here, really depend on this endosymbiosis with symbiodinium, uh, which is a dinoflagellate algae. And um, that's kind of like the fam famous enigmatic one that everybody thinks of. Um, but it's becoming increasingly recognized that these kind of mix mixotrophic uh, facultative associations between heterotrophs and autotrophs uh, are, are probably really important and, and actually uh, the most common forms of life in planktonic ecosystems, uh, you know, rather than being a sort of weird exception, uh, they're probably the sort of predominant mode of life in the plankton. Um, but they're also really uh, important in terms of the evolution of eukaryotes and cell biological evolution, um, which is kind of another aspect that we're really interested in. So this chart here just shows the diversity of different photosynthetic single-celled eukaryotes and how the different plastids, uh, chloroplasts, have sort of been transferred between many different lineages multiple times. Um, so these are, these are just the cases where we have sort of fixed, stable chloroplasts, things we'd call organelles. Um, as Megan alluded to, if you consider things that are more in facultative associations, there's a much wider range of, of organisms across the tree. Um, so you can see the chloroplasts in the solid lines, you can see the facultative endosymbiont lineages in eukaryotes in the dotted lines. And then there's even weirder stuff um, going on as well, this kleptoplastidy where organisms steal uh, chloroplasts from their prey. Um, the really kind of famous example of that is some of the sea slugs uh, do that kind of cool stuff. So um, what we're really interested in is how these endosymbioses establish because They've established really many times in Earth's history. Um, it's not like mitochondria, which have just happened once. So what we're interested in to know is what kind of ecological factors drive uh, these associations um, and cause them to happen more often. Um, so earlier in the year, we published a paper about exploitative host control in, in this system. Um, so why we think it's exploitative is because the growth of symbiotic in the black versus aposymbiotic uh, is without symbionts in the white uh, is kind of con context dependence in, in terms of light so that hosts uh, really benefit from the symbiosis at high light but they pay quite a large cost uh, in the dark when there's low light. Um, so for the hosts the symbiosis is good provided there's light. The, this next graph shows the numbers of symbionts per host cell across the same light gradient. And what you can see is that it peaks at a sort of low light intensity. And that's because uh, when there's not very much light around, you need lots of symbionts in order to give you the amount of carbon uh, you need to satisfy your, your energetic demands. Um, at high light, the hosts are able to downregulate their symbiont densities uh, because they don't need so many to provide the same amount of carbon, uh, but they'll be paying a bigger nitrogen cost for that. If you compare that to how the algae would grow in the free living state out in the environment, uh, they would just increase their abundance and their growth uh, with light. So the kind of difference between these two lines is the kind of cost that the algae are paying um, as part of the symbiosis. So what we kind of argue is that if you just consider this from a growth or metabolic context, um, it's kind of an exploitation because the hosts are sort of exploiting their symbionts. Um, now, I've underlined if, there might be other things which really make it mutualism, but if you just consider the sort of metabolic interaction, the growth dynamics, then it seems like an exploitation. 
So um, what we're going to look at today in this talk is whether this is true for many different strains of Paramecium viscera and chlorella. Um, and, you know, do some seem more mutualistic or more exploitative than other strains? So um, this is the same sort of plot as that first one you saw. So the growth rates of hosts with symbionts in green and without symbionts in white. And a range of different strains. Um, and what you can see is that sort of in the top panel, um, those strains display a kind of similar pattern to the one, one we saw in that previous paper, where um, hosts benefit in the light but pay a cost in the dark. Um, in, the, in these strains, there's some positive low growth when you don't have symbionts, uh, which is sort of faster growth than in, with symbionts in the dark. Um, but as we move down and look at some different strains, they're not so well able to survive without their symbionts, so they have some negative growth rates. And uh, this strain in particular at the bottom, uh, this HK1, uh, you just can't grow it without its symbionts. So you remove them, and they basically die within four or five days. Um, so we're kind of confirming what we saw in the, in, in, in the previous paper to an extent, but there is some variation in hosts' ability to survive without their endosymbionts. Um, so that second panel we showed, showed in, the, in the sort of previous paper slide where we looked at the um, symbiont density per host cell. Um, again, we've done this for many strains, five different strains, and it's using the same kinds of techniques which Megan talked about with the flow cytometry to get estimates of the chlorophyll fluorescence of individual host cells as a, as a kind of proxy for the number of endosymbionts they have inside them. Um, these graphs, what you can see is a, a whole bunch of different light intensities um, you can see the distribution. So these are like violin plots. They're like uh, histograms, distributions sort of flipped around in the vertical. Um, and you can see that within a population, you get quite a lot of variation in the symbiont density, but that it still follows the same pattern which we saw in the previous paper. So in the dark, they have the lowest symbiont densities per cell. Uh, you give them a tiny little bit of light, and they sort of upregulate the numbers let them grow more because they need more to be able to access the, the limited light that's available. And then as we turn the light up, they sort of downregulate, suppress their symbiont populations to avoid having to pay such a high cost when there's so much light and they can get carbon for pretty cheap. So again, we're seeing the same kinds of things which we saw, and there's not very much variation uh, between our strains. They're all kind of doing the same thing. So we're kind of interested in, uh, in, in, hosts, in host control and host control in their, their symbionts. And you're going to see a bit more of this in Andy's talk uh, later. But we're interested in trying to quantify uh, how much host control there is. Um, and especially making a comparison between sort of down regulation and up regulation. So what we're doing here is this is just an exact, the same graph that you saw on the bottom, just sort of zoomed in. And uh, what we did for down regulation is we sort of incubated them at the light level where they had the highest load, and then we switched them into the dark where they want the lowest load, and then we just look at the kind of speed at which they change their densities. Um, and sort of for up regulation, it's the same, but the opposite. So we start them in the dark, and then we switch them to the low light level. So they want to quickly increase their symbiont densities. And what we see for a whole bunch of strains uh, is kind of the same pattern again for, for all of the strains, but uh, what I hope you can notice is that they're better at down-regulating their symbiont population, so it's easy to kind of kick them out, digest them, get rid of them, um, but what they don't seem to be able to do so well is to up-regulate their symbiont populations when, when they need to. Um, and when we were first kind of thinking about this, what we thought was that probably they could just acquire symbionts from the environment. So in these experiments, there are many symbionts in the environment, in, in the external media. Um, and, and we thought, you used to think that they were probably able to just pick those up if they wanted a higher symbiont density. But I think this data suggests that's probably not true. Again, there's not that much variation between the strains. Broadly speaking, they're following this same pattern. Um, so this final bit of data is, you know, it's almost a bit of a teaser, really. Um, but it's some of the, the, the early work that we've done with meta, metabolomic uh, work. So 
This is mass spectrometry data, um, which comes from two strains. So uh, these two strains are the ones that are from the UK and ones from Japan. So they're really kind of geographically uh, isolated or separated from each other. And what we've done is we've incubated each one of those strains uh, to three different light levels. So no, no light, low light, and high light. And then we've extracted the metabolites from both the host and the symbiont sort of independently. And then we've um, done some mass spec uh, with Duncan Cameron in Sheffield. And we, we're looking at the variation that we get between the strains, but also the different light conditions <coughs> to just kind of get a general sense of how much metabolic variability there is for these partnerships. So um, this first plot just shows the different metabolic fractions and the sort of PC, PCA analysis of that. For the symbiont on the host, and you can see that we get quite a nice separation of, of the two fractions. Um, if we look at the two strains, so HA1, which is from Japan, and 186, which is from the UK, you see we don't really get any separation. So their metabolic profiles at the, at the broad level um, sort of overlap with one another, which we found to be quite surprising. Um, and it's you know really indicative of quite a high level of convergence in the sort of metabolic functioning of these cells. Um, that's slightly in contrast to what we see at the different light levels, uh, again, for the same data. So um, if you just ignore the right-hand set of points, which are from the paramecium fraction, and just look at the symbiont fractions, you'll see that they do cluster based on uh, the light conditions that they've been acclimated to for this experiment. So what we're seeing is that the kind of environment induces more metabolic differences in, into these cells than uh, being from different sides of the planet, uh, which we think is very interesting. So um, here's just some conclusions uh, about that work. So I think in this case, we've actually found limited phenotypic variation between the different strains. They seem to, roughly speaking, follow the same kinds of patterns. Um, the only real difference, the real clear difference that we saw was that some host strains were better able to survive without their symbionts. Um, <clears throat> the fact that hosts are better at down-regulating their symbionts uh, is another interesting thing that we found uh, from this work, which wasn't known before. And probably, at least in that growth metabolic context, these are still examples of exploitation in all of these strains. So what we'd like to look at further is whether this exploitation can help explain the early establishment of endosymbioses. You know, is that like a, a, a general model for how these things start in the first place? Um, so should thank all the different people that, help, that have helped with this work. Um, they're all there. And also, I'm just going to make a little plug. Uh, so if you're not busy at lunchtime today and you're, you're interested in art, then please do come over to the Tate Gallery, which is just in the Albert Dock, where uh, Lawrence Payot, who's, a, who's an artist, who um, has sort of taken some of the ideas from our research uh, to explore some concepts of symbiosis. And uh, thank you. Maybe time for one question. That's nice. Okay. Thanks, you. like a minute ago, what? <laughs> I'm just finding this battery. Oh, God, the mic. There we go. Okay, next up we have Belinda Kant. Thank you for coming to my talk, which is about uh, the phylogenetics and co-phylogenetics of uh, South African uh, bee genus and its host plant. 
So we all know that um, bees are really important pollinators, but so far it's not so well understood to what extent has there been co-evolution between pollinators and their host plants. So when I say co-evolution, then I mean uh, the reciprocal evolution of interacting species, which generally results in co-adaptation of both interaction partners. And this is also a really important process for generating the biodiversity that we see on Earth. So the concept of co-evolution was already introduced by Darwin, who hypothesized that um, the Malagasy star orchid must be pollinated by a, um, a pollinator which has an exceptionally long tongue, which you see here. So uh, he actually hypothesized that there might be co-evolution between the spur length of the plant and the tongue length of the pollinator. So in South Africa, we have uh, the succulent carbon vegetation region, which is really a worldwide biodiversity hotspot and which shows a really great diversity of plants, what you can already really colorfully see here on the picture. And also a lot of these pollination systems, they are highly specialized and they also have a lot of uh, remarkable adaptations. So it's also a really great place to uh, look for systems that might be potentially co-evolving. So one um, plant pollinator system where it has been hypothesized that it is co-evolving is the one between uh, Rediviva bees and the Diastia host plants. So um, these bees, these Rediviva bees, they have um, extremely elongated front legs which they use to collect oil from the transverse of its host. So uh, the bee then lands on the flower <coughs> and then inserts its legs and rubs the knee against uh, the spur walls which have the oil secreting hairs. Then it transfers the oil to uh, its hind legs, transports it then to the nest, and then it loses it for uh, larvae provisioning. So really interesting is now that we see a variation in leg length between different Rediviva species, but we also have a variation within Rediviva species. And the same is true for its host. So you have this variation in the spur length <coughs> between different species, but you also have this variation within and on the right, you always see uh, the host for the bee on the left. And what you can already guess here is what Steiner and Whitehead found in the 1990s uh, in Rediviva Neliana population, so that you really have um, a significant correlation between the front leg of the bee and the spur length of the host. So which suggests that there might be co-evolution <coughs> between them on the population level but still, uh, when you have a correlation like that, you cannot also rule out other explanations uh, rather than co-evolution could be also ecological fitting. So what we now wanted to do, um, we wanted to investigate the co-evolution of Rediviva and Diastia, but of course, to first understand the co-evolution of both, you have to understand um, the evolution of the individual taxa. So we first uh, reconstructed the phylogeny for Rediviva and then also investigated the tray that is uh, important for the interaction with the plant, which is the leg length for rhymes. So, and then when I reconstructed then the phylogeny and then asked how many origins of long legs do we have, then I could then go to the next step, investigate the co-evolution, and we were doing that also um, by kind of an indirect evidence by looking for co-speciation events in co-phylogenetic analysis. But what is really important um, to point out here is that uh, co-evolution doesn't mean co-speciation. So even if you don't find co-speciation, doesn't mean that there is no co-evolution and also the other way around. So uh, overall, we were investigating 19 of the 26 uh, described Rediviva species, three uh, Redivivoides species, which is um, a closely related <coughs> sister of Rediviva and then several Melita outgroups. So we sequenced them on six nuclear and one mitochondrial gene, reconstructed then the phylogeny, and then mapped the leg length onto this phylogeny with MESKIT. And we were also um, trying to infer the ancestral leg length for especially interesting um, nodes using base traits. So what we found was then that we have five strongly supported subgroups within Rediviva, which I given here in red letters, which were on all the three different analyses that uh, we did, uh, supported by a really high posterior probability of one. And when we also then uh, dated the origin of the whole Ready Weaver clade, it was inferred to be around 29 million years ago. 
So and then the next thing what we did, we um, mapped uh, the relative leg length onto the tree that I've just shown to you. And it looks like there must be at least two independent origins of long leg Bs, which I then highlighted here also again in red. And uh, when we dated the origin, the first origin of long leg, it was around 12 to 17 million years ago, so much later than the origin of the whole Red River clade, suggesting that the ancestor of the clade must be a short legged one. <coughs> Nicely supported uh, was this also by uh, a lack of a phylogenetic signal, because um, we didn't find that lambdas, uh, a page's lambda was significant. So um, you don't see that the long legged bees, the red ones, are more closely related to each other than you would expect by chance. So you cannot really explain this pattern of long legs just by uh, relatedness. So there must be other ecological factors, like for example, selection due to the host plant that caused this long legs. So, and like I said, we also inferred for interesting notes, um, the relative um, leg length of the ancestors with based traits. And what we then saw that for the hypothesized long leg ancestors, the relative leg length was always smaller than 0.53, while uh, you see in the most extreme extent taxa, Rediviva Antorum, that has um, a relative oh, <laughs> a relative leg length of 0.76, uh, suggesting that really um, leg length is really evolving quite fast. So now to the cophylogenetics. So I just showed you the phylogeny that I generated, and then we took um, the phylogeny of the plant, the host plant, Diastia, that my colleague Wesley from South Africa generated by sequencing the ITS region for Diastia. And then we are using uh, visitation data because uh, we needed to know so which plant is visited by which bee. And overall, we just uh, included 16 uh, plant pollinator interactions because we are then just concentrating on the main hosts for the, plant, uh, for the bee. And I was using two different uh, cophylogenetic analysis, so a distance-based uh, approach and um, an event-based approach. So why you in the distance-based approach, you just um, look for the overall congruence of uh, your host and your pollinator phylogeny by uh, assuming that actually when you have congruence, that means co-speciation, but you don't know when you don't find any congruence what might be the case. While in the event-based methods, you uh, try to reconstruct the most probable uh, evolutionary history um, by assuming several evolutionary events, which are co-speciation, host switching, duplications, and sorting. So, and uh, then you just not only get um, congruence or not, so you also get uh, the nature and the frequency of events, so you know actually on which node uh, was suggested or most likely that an event happened and how often did it overall happen. So, and then uh, we randomized these links then uh, to establish if it was significant or not. And what we then found with the distance-based um, method was um, that both our distance-based method in Parafit and the one in Paco, they showed that our Diastia phylogeny and the Rediviva phylogeny, they are not congruent, what you can already guess here, because in light blue, uh, you have the links between which bee visits which plant, and you see it's completely a mess, so it's completely random. And also in the event-based analysis, uh, also um, the event-based analysis in Coral Park suggested that the most parsimonious reconstruction uh, included five co-speciation events, which are highlighted here in light green, we found that this is not a significant finding because uh, when we randomized the links, in at least 26% uh, of the cases, we found five or even more co-speciation events. Moreover, also when we compared the node ages for our uh, plant and the bee, in four out of this five uh, suggested co-speciation events, the node ages, they largely mismatched. Of course, you might say uh, this node estimates they are always uh, associated with a large error, but uh, it was quite much. So there was only one, which I highlighted here in red, but um, which you can, where you can roughly say that might be fitting, but um, overall, it doesn't look that we have co-speciation here based on both analysis, so this suggests there's no co-speciation, and based on that, you might 
infer maybe there's no coevolution on the species level. So, and to just sum up, so what did we found? We found several origins of long legs. We also found that uh, leg length is really fastly evolving, so it's probably a really highly labeled uh, trait. We didn't find any significant uh, congruence between the plant and the bee uh, phylogeny, so suggesting that probably the leg length variants, so the adaptation to the horse plant, doesn't play such an important role in uh, Rediviva diversification. But still, like I said also in the beginning, doesn't mean even if you don't find co-speciation, the co-evolution is not happening. So what is really likely is that co-evolution <coughs> might happen on the population level, like was also found by Steiner and Whitehead, where they also uh, suggested that there might be co-evolution on the population level for Rediviva Neyana. And that's why we are now also um, doing some population level analysis for Rediviva longimanus, which is one species with the most extremes length like you can see here and also has a high variance uh, between different populations. So we now actually try to uh, tackle these genes that might underlie leg length uh, variance by assuming that they probably are really under strong selection pressures. So we try now uh, with rat sequencing data to really look on um, FST outliers, so genes under selection to actually maybe find some regions that might be um, causing this difference in the leg length. So there are a lot of uh, people that I'm really thankful to that contributed to this really nice project. So Wesley and um, <coughs> his supervisors from the Wits University, then uh, Michael Kuhlmann uh, from the Natural History Museum of London, who is now in Kiel, who sampled all the bees, then the people from the Cornell Lab uh, from Brian Danford, who were um, helping me a lot with the phylogenetics. Then uh, Dennis Miché and uh, Anton Paul, who also were involved in a lot of uh, this phylogenetic work. And then also, of course, all my funding bodies and my own working group. And now I also want to thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, Rosa. We've got time for a couple questions. Not so shy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, that was really great. Um, so I was just noticing when you were reconstructing your trait, you, know, you had Hegel's lambda and you had p value in your observation. Mm -hmm. So um, if you show that there's no significant difference from a lambda of zero, then when you're reconstructing in Bayes traits, looking at what the ancestral things were, what kind of model yeah. evolution are you using? Uh, it was actually also um, a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, and it was. Um, a random uh, walk model for base traits when we inferred that. But I also did uh, a likelihood uh, analysis and it was also not so much different from these findings. Okay, yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, mm -hmm. so because it, if it's a random walk, that's a Brownian motion model, right? So yeah. Because lambda is meant to be a sort of a Brownian mm -hmm. kind of yeah, I, I mean, uh, when it's under selection, then uh, you usually would not assume that it's really just a, a random thing. That's that's why. It's so, but we are also uh, looking at um, other um, because there are several measurements for uh, phylogenetic signals. So we are also using Bloomberg's K. Which is also based around <coughs> mm, and um, we were also um, then checking actually. Um, which are um, an OU, ornstein ulmbeck process, if this fits better than a Brownian motion model. And this was actually the case, so uh, which suggests that there might be not just uh, drift, but really also some selection causing really a direction and not just that it is really random. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, not sure right. it's working yet. Yeah. Ran out of batteries or something.
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Next up we have Brian Germain from the University of Aberdeen. Great, thank you all very much for coming. <clears throat> I'm gonna apologize in advance about my voice. I got a little enthusiastic towards the band last night. Uh, but I'm gonna try to talk about some of the work I've been doing uh, for my postdoc with Jane Reed, looking at different aspects of how polyandry can affect relatedness structure and ultimately the potential for inbreeding in uh, wild animal populations. Um, so polyandry is widely observed across taxonomic groups, uh, and for our purposes today we're talking about cases where females are mating with multiple males within a single defined reproductive event. Um, and the widespread occurrence of polyandry <coughs> in nature suggests there's some intrinsic evolutionary benefit uh, to this behavior. But its existence is still puzzling because in a lot of cases the costs associated with polyandry seem to outweigh any obvious uh, direct benefits. So this suggests that uh, the benefits, potential, one, uh, that the potential benefits of polyandry might be indirect uh, rather than just increased fitness of the focal female. Um, so there have been numerous indirect genetic benefits that have been proposed, but many of them um, impose additional costs or require some form of active female mate choice um, with respect to her initial mate versus any um, additional males that she encounters in the population. So one less widely considered uh, indirect benefit is how uh, polyandry under random mating can affect sib ships and ultimately the potential for inbreeding. So if you think of a case of a female that mates with a single male, all the offspring she produces are full siblings, so they share both a mother and a father. And here uh, the shading of the offspring represent the paternal link and the patterning of this box, which is not showing up too well, is the maternal link. Whereas the female that mates with multiple males produces both full sib and half sib offspring. So where individuals mate locally, so where your pool of potential mates include the individuals in this box, um, like we often see in small populations or where dispersal is limited, you can see that on average the level of inbreeding uh, for the polyandrous female will be less because there'll be some uh, full sib and half sib mating going on here as opposed to the all full sib mating uh, among the offspring of the monandrous female. So what this means is that the grand offspring of, poly of polyandrous females, so the offspring that are the result of these matings, will be less inbred on average. Uh, and given inbreeding depression and fitness, we can see how over time um, the fitness of the descendants of the polyandrous female will be higher, and so the alleles underlying the behavior can persist or even increase in the population. Um, so that's all well and good, but what this kind of general hypothesis doesn't take into account is that in natural populations, males are mating with multiple females. So here we have a case where males are mating with different monandrous and polyandrous females. So what we end up getting is the creation of paternal half-siblings. Um, and also a decrease in the number of unrelated or, or more distantly related individuals in the population. So it can lead to subtle uh, but if you think about it, kind of spread out over time and spread over the population, um, substantial effects on subship structure. Uh, the other thing that this doesn't really take into account is, well, it's great for uh, semel parasite species or where you get a case of a single female founding a new population like in seed beetles or flower beetles. Um, but what it doesn't take into account is the case of overlapping generations uh, that we would commonly see in natural populations where your pool of potential mates would include not just full and half siblings, but also if it's a female, your father, your grandfather, your cousin, nephew, uncle, uh, and more distant relatives. The other thing is that in these small or isolated populations, uh, consistent levels of inbreeding over time can lead to more complex effects on the distribution of relatedness. So here we just have a toy pedigree where two individuals are related in that they share this common red allele uh, inherited from their maternal grandfather. So if they mate, they produce an inbred offspring. Now if this offspring is then going to mate with one of its parents, it actually has a much higher probability of sharing these common ancestral alleles than we would um, expect between a parent and an offspring mating in an otherwise uh, outbred population. So to really kind of get at this question of how does polyandry affect inbreeding, we also need to quantify its effects on relatedness and not just relationship. So the goals of our study were to do just that, to quantify how polyandry affects 
SIB ships, um, given all these messier things that we were talking about, like males mating with multiple females and so on? And also, how does polyandry affect the potential for inbreeding given its effects on relationships and relatedness? So to get at this, we used a long-term study population of song sparrows um, on Mandardi Island, which is part of a larger island uh, meta population off the coast of British Columbia in Canada. So it's a small songbird that forms socially monogamous breeding pairs, but it's genetically promiscuous. So while a male and a female will pair up and raise offspring together, both members of that pair are trying to engage in extra pair matings with other individuals. So it's a really tiny island. It's really easy to study these birds. Uh, and we've been doing it since 1975. So what we can do, so we know the identity of every pair in the population and the identity of all the offspring. So what we can do is uh, construct a social pedigree which links all individuals in the population to their mother and her socially paired mate. Uh, and then starting in 1993, we began collecting blood samples and <coughs> assigning genetic paternity. Uh, and we know from these samples that roughly 28% of offspring are sired by extra pair males. So any male other than uh, their mother's socially paired mate. So we can use this information to construct a genetic pedigree which corrects for this extra pair paternity. And so it's assigning uh, an individual to their mother and true genetic father. So if you think about it, our observations from the study system really form kind of two parallel data sets. One which represents a natural mating system under monandry, given the social pedigree. Um, and the other, which incorporates extra pair mating and hence underlying polyandry given the genetic pedigree. And so we know that uh, mating is effectively random with respect to relatedness, so females aren't actively avoiding inbreeding through their choice of social or extra pair mate. Um, and so what this allows us to do is see how polyandry in the past can trickle down through the pedigree to affect the distribution or affect the, the potential for inbreeding with closer and more distant relatives. And so the key thing to keep in mind is that the only difference between these two pedigrees is who the father is in 28% of cases. So otherwise they're identical uh, in terms of individual longevity, female reproductive success, and offspring survival. So really any differences that we see between the two in terms of their effects on the potential for inbreeding should stem solely from this extra pair mating. Um, so getting back to this first question of how does polyandry affect sibship structures, um, so we first took all females uh, for a kind of focal study period that produced at least two offspring, so one potential sib ship, one pairwise comparison. Um, and then we worked out the proportion of those pairwise comparisons that were among full siblings and among half siblings um, for both the social and the genetic pedigree. And if we think about sib ship structure in kind of an idealized way, this is what we would expect, where if a female is uh, monandrous for her entire life, 100% of her offspring will be full siblings and 0% will be half siblings. And then as we introduce polyandry, um, these proportions will change somewhat. We'll get some proportion of full sibs, some proportion of half sibs. What we end up actually seeing is quite varied in that we do get some females that follow the same pattern of 100% uh, full sib uh, offspring under the social pedigree and some lower proportion under the genetic pedigree. But two things I want to point out is first the spread here that we get under the social pedigree. So what's going on is these females are producing offspring with multiple males following death or divorce of their initial mate. So even though they're not engaging in any active form of simultaneous polyandry, there's this sequential changing of mates, which you can see can, can really change the sibship structure. And in some cases it can, can be quite high, like up to six males per female. Uh, and the other thing is that some of these lines, not many of them, but some of them actually go up under the genetic pedigree. So they're producing more full sibs under extra pair mating than we would otherwise expect. So what's most likely going on here is that these females are engaging in consistent extra pair mating with the same males um, over multiple broods. So they're actually producing more full siblings, it's just with not the male that we expect. So the point of all this is just to show that Different aspects of natural mating systems, like death and divorce and repeat extra pair mating, can really shift our expectation of sibship structure uh, and then how that will trickle down to affect the potential for inbreeding. Um, so going back to this main question, how does polyandry affect the potential um, for inbreeding? We again took all these females and worked out all the males that she could 
mate with over her lifetime. So all the males that were alive in the same years that she was alive. And then we trace the ancestry of both members of that pair up through both the social and genetic pedigree um, at 17 levels of relationship, which I'll show in a second. And then we calculated for relatedness uh, the coefficient of pairwise kinship between the two individuals given both the social and genetic pedigrees. And so kinship is the probability that two homolog homologous alleles from each individual are common by descent. So it's that measure of how, um, how, how related they are. <laughs> Um, and it's actually a really useful metric because it's, the, it's equivalent to the coefficient of inbreeding for any offspring that result from that mating. Um, so first looking at uh, relationships, and here we just have uh, the increase, decrease, or no change that was at least uh, statistically significant for the mean number of matings that uh, females have at these different levels of relationship. And so the main thing to get is not only do we see this drop in the number of potential matings between full siblings and the increase in half siblings, uh, but we get these kind of more subtle uh, but substantial changes in more distant degrees of relationship, like uncles and nephews and so on. And when we scale it up to the population, we see more or less the same thing. Um, and so what's really going on here is the lion's share of matings are shifting from second and third degree relatives down to fourth, de fourth degree relatives. So again, these half uncles, half single first cousins, that is a consequence of that change in sibships. Um, and then <clears throat> if you look at the distribution of that coefficient of kinship, we see a pretty long drawn out distribution. And for reference here, um, these three lines represent what kinship would be between uh, mating between a, uh, full siblings, half siblings, and single first cousins. So you can see that on average, or the average uh, level of inbreeding just under random mating is somewhere between first cousins and half siblings. So it's a pretty inbred population. And some of them are much, much higher than you would expect under, than uh, between full siblings. So when we add, um, we can then tack on the distribution of relatedness given the genetic pedigree. And there's a couple things just to point out. The first is the mean goes down a little bit. It's significant, but it's not drastic. What's kind of more striking is we get this overall left shift in the distribution. So we're getting uh, fewer of these relationships at these really high levels, or fewer of these potential means between these really high levels of relationship, and more falling at these really low levels. So that means the offspring coming out of these potential matings are less inbred. And so even though the effects are quite small, as we would expect them to be, given that they have to accumulate over time, they can still have pretty strong consequences for the descendants of polyandrous females, given the shape of inbreeding depression. So if inbreeding depression followed an epistatic or a threshold curve, we can see that a decrease in the number of matings at these intermediate high levels of inbreeding, even if it was balanced out by more matings at these lower levels, um, can result in, in uh, much higher fitness for the descendants of these females, allowing the alleles to persist in the population. So overall, our results suggest that polyandry reduces the overall level of inbreeding, given its effects on sibships and relationships and relatedness. And you can see that over a population, over time, this could be pretty advantageous for the uh, descendants of successful lineages because they would, by definition, have more potential relatives to mate with. Um, but the main thing to keep in mind is that different aspects of natural mating systems, um, we need to consider how they might temper or buffer the effects of this mechanism to ultimately understand how it might uh, influence the ongoing evolution of polyandry. So that, I'll just thank everyone who helped out and take any questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks, I have, have one question, I think. Yeah. Um, no, well, so there's one other study that actually did the same thing in a, in a larger population of songsters, and they found the exact same number, uh, like 28% of offspring. So it's, it's pretty much the same on the mainland and other islands as we get on this one. It's just, we can measure this with a lot more detail because we know for sure uh, who the father is, um, and we have a lot of markers for it, so it's kind of easier to rule out um, who the father might be. Thank you Thank you. Much. Is this not working?
Okay, next up we have Andrew Dean from the University of York. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, evolution in a photosynthetic symbiosis, following on from Megan and Ewan, who spoke earlier. And so I'm not going to do so much background as they did. I'm just going to dive straight in. Hopefully we haven't had too much flux of people in and out and you'll be able to follow what I'm doing. So this is the uh, situation to keep in mind as I'm talking uh, about this. We've got these algae happily photosynthesizing, but then you can see that they're constrained, and that's because they're living inside a cilia, Paramecium berseria. And it's this relationship between the host and the symbiont inside that I'm going to try and model. Uh, today to try and understand some of the data that uh, Megan and Ewan have been uh, coming up with. So, we'll start by just thinking about what's a, what's a minimal endosymbiotic ecosystem. We have hosts and we have symbionts. Um, hosts and symbionts can both uh, divide and die, and there is some transfer of symbionts between the, um, the free-living population and the uh, symbiotic population, because this is a uh, facultative uh, uh, relationship, not an obligate one. And then we have uh, nutrition. So the assumption here, as uh, touched upon by Ewan, is that the nutritional relationship between the host and the symbiont is what is key to de describing this symbiosis. So algae, whether they are internal or external, they get carbon by photosynthesis. And the hosts uh, predate bacteria and get some carbon and nitrogen from them. And then if we look at the, uh, those algae that are living in symbiosis, well now they become uh, dependent upon their hosts for their other nutritional needs. So nitrogen being a key one that we'll focus on here. And so the hosts will feed some of, their, uh, some of their nitrogen that they obtain from their bacteria to the symbiont in exchange for photosynthetic carbon. And this results in a net gain of carbon for the host, ideally. And even though it has to lose a little bit as it feeds its symbiont, depending on what the, uh, the exact molecule is that it's uh, giving over. Um, just here is a, another picture of um, our model organism that we've been working with experimentally. Um, you can see the, the ciliates with um, a nice population of algae living inside. And there's, you can see there's a few free-living algae around. might not be very clear to those at the back. But then the question we might want to ask is, is this nutrient trading, whether the exchange rate is, uh, is expensive or cheap for the host, uh, is that sufficient to characterise the symbiosis? Because we have a spectrum between exploitation, where the hosts are in charge and exploiting their symbionts, through mutualism, where they're both working together, through to parasitism, where it's the symbionts who are just extracting from the host. And well, I'm going to argue that it isn't. And we saw this data uh, earlier. I'm just going to go over it again uh, briefly. We have this partner conflict. So on the left we see what happens um, to the host when it's grown in isolation or with symbionts. And on the right, we have the same thing for the symbionts. So if we look at the, the white squares on the left-hand side, that is the host in isolation. It doesn't matter how much light there is, the host grows about the same. In contrast, if it's got symbionts living with it, at low light, it does really badly. This is because the symbionts have become parasites they're just taking nutrition without giving, giving anything back. As light increases, symbionts start to give a bit more carbon back until at high light, we can see that the hosts are doing much better with symbionts because they're getting this extra nutrition from photosynthesis. Um, contrast this to the symbionts. So the white squares, where they're just growing by themselves, the more light, the more photosynthesis, the more algae. But if they are symbiotic, then there comes a point where symbionts start to do less well. And this is because um, we surmise that um, for the same net gain of carbon, you need 
fewer symbionts. And so it makes sense for the host to get rid of some because then the nitrogen that it would be giving to its symbionts, it can use for itself. And so we have these competing strategies. And so uh, the aim here is to build a, uh, a mechanistic model um, of this relationship based on this nutrient trading in order to reproduce the observed phenomenon. And just to go into a little bit more detail of what this is, we have, so this is experimental data for various strains of paramecium and their um, associate chlorella, and we see at low light, then the simian population is quite low, there's a sharp increase as light increases, and then this decrease as we go to higher light. It's just uh, highlighting this um, uh, so this, so, so this is the, um, it suggests that it is the host in control because so the symbionts are doing less well as light increases. So, let's take a moment to think about some maths. We, we look at a, um, a population of hosts, we divide them up according to how many symbionts they have, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, and then each of these populations can grow it can divide or die, um, so, and we assume that there is synchrony between uh, the two partners in the symbiosis, so that a host that divides um, has daughter cells with the same number of symbionts, and then there is gain of symbionts, which moves you up this chain of uh, host populations, and there's loss of symbionts, which moves you down. For those of you who care about such things, this gives us the equa this equation, oh, this set of, set of equations. So we have gain of symbionts, we have birth and death of hosts, and we have loss of symbionts. And there's logistic growth incorporated in here as well. So the idea of this is to use the, um, uh, this nutrient trading to, uh, and to quantify its um, quantify the effect of nutrient trading on growth. So, here we show a schematic of host nutrition. So the blue line is carbon, and it gets carbon from its food, but it gives them away, and it gets carbon from the symbionts. So this results in a, an increase in carbon as symbiont load increases. In contrast, there's no nitrogen gain from symbionts, it's just lots. So the more symbionts you have, the less nitrogen you have. And so the nitrogen availability decreases. And we found that this uh, nutrient intake is balanced at this point, um, K, K back. Ignore the lambda, I changed that, but it doesn't seem to have uh, come up uh, here. This is a slightly old version, annoyingly. Um, OK, so then if we put the host growth on top of this, host growth is, is limited by the least abundant nutrients. So it follows whichever um, out of carbon and nitrogen is limiting. But then there's a slight downward shift, and this is because of some additional cost of symbiosis, things like membrane upkeep and such, on, so, such like. And so if this um, cost is too high, if there are too many symbionts, then this growth will actually become negative as the symbionts become parasites. We... And, and then what we put in is the ability for hosts to manage their symbiont load. So what they want to be uh, is at this, this point k bal, the, 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 the point where nutrition is optimal. And that is where the growth rate is maximal. And so what we allow the host to do is to invest in gain of symbionts, if doing so will increase its, um, its growth rate or loss. If, that will, if it is that which will increase its growth rate. So it's carbon limited, it wants to gain them. If it's nitrogen limited, it wants to lose them. So, um, how does this um, work with different light levels? So, we have our optimum uh, load, which is this dotted line at the top. And this, the, the top plot shows us our, our symbiont load in the population. Um, so looking at the blue line, when there's no host control, then we just have this increase in symbiont load. Compare that to hosts in the bottom panel, hosts start to do less well as light increases. But as they increase their management of the symbiont load, as they increase host control, 
Symbians do less well in high light as the load approaches this optimum, but the hosts do much better. And so an increasing host control yields a fitter host. And this is similar to the experimental results I showed you at the beginning, where we have this sharp increase and this steady decrease in the mean symbiont load as light increases. And so what this suggests is that there must be some sort of host control going on here in order to, for the host to manage its symbiont load so its, um, its symbiont load is close to this optimal value where its nutrition is balanced. And then finally we wanted to investigate how this might evolve. And so uh, we just did some simple adaptive dynamics for um, anyone who's familiar with, with that sort of thing. And uh, what we say is that the, uh, the amount of host control you have it evolves, but there's a trade-off in that symbionts become more costly. As you invest in controlling your population, you, um, you lose a bit of, um, a bit of growth because you're, uh, you, you're doing this control. And so let's just take a moment to explain here. So we have a resident trait. So that's the background population. They're happily existing with a certain level of host control. And then a mutant comes along. So you're here where you're the resident and the, the mutant are the, are the same thing. That's effectively no mutant. And then if a mutant comes along and we jump up here, so there's a small population with a higher level of host control, then they can, in these plus areas, these dark areas, then they can invade and they become the new resident. And so we do this stepwise increase to this point. So if, if a mutant comes along with a lower level of host control, it can't invade, so we revert back to the original, um, uh, to the original resident trait. And so, if the trade-off isn't isn't too bad, then we have this evolutionary stable state here, but which uh, corresponds to a maximum in the host population. Um, if it's a bit more costly, then we end up with so if it's quite costly, then as you invest in host control, the fitness of the host decreases, so it can't evolve over here. And we have this transition where you can uh, evolve a bit of host control, but it has to be sufficiently big to get you up into here, to get to this evolutionary stable state. You have this barrier. So we've got this uh, mechanistic model based on the nutrient trading, and we have argued that it's both nutrient trading and host control that characterizes the symbiosis. The host control um, optimizes host growth by controlling its symbiont load, so it's exploitation of symbionts. And this adaptive dynamics analysis that I touched on at the end um, indicates that it can be evolutionarily stable at the cost of um, increasing the, the, the cost of symbiosis. And this model prediction, along with the empirical data, implies that the host control is biologically important. Um, and thank you to the, the team, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Andrew. Maybe time for one question. No? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Will Pierce. Uh, do you want me to? Uh, you, you can go ahead and start. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the day after the gala. Thank you for making it. We're nearly at 12 o'clock. We're nearly at coffee. We're nearly at lunch. So stay with me, everyone. Um, my name's Will. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about some new methods I've been developing to try and incorporate a bit of ecological dynamics into macroevolutionary modeling. 
I'm interested in lots of different ecosystems throughout the world. I think that uh, all of these places, some of which I've been lucky enough to go on holiday to, are really beautiful places. I'd really like to develop methods where we can both understand how those systems evolved and how their ecology plays out and how we can use both of those things to inform each other. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is some uh, brand new work I've been uh, working on at the moment, uh, trying to understand a sort of a, a simple anolis lizard data set. So this is all very preliminary, so I'm really grateful for any feedback you've got on it. So what I'm going to do to start off with is I'm going to talk you through a little background about the field of ecophylogenetics and sort of how I think we can use evolutionary history to understand ecological dynamics. I'm then going to talk about uh, sort of trait and environmental relationships using some sort of off-the-shelf tools in something called a phylogenetic generalized linear mixed model. But because it's the day after the gala, there will be no maths, don't worry. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about some new models that try to incorporate some sort of mechanism into those evolutionary and kind of ecological interactions. And then I'll sort of comment on where we might go from here in that regard. So, starting off talking about ecophylogenetics and uh, analyst stuff. So ecophylogenetics, I think, is the most amazing and incredible field, but I would say that because I'm, I'm trying to work in it. Um, I think it's fantastic because it's trying to incorporate so many different things and so many different processes, trying to incorporate biogeography, uh, niche structuring, and the evolution of species niches. So I think it's, it's fantastic. And I think we're seeing a real resurgence right now of brand new methods in it, which I'm sort of calling here ecophylogenetics 2.0, um, where people are trying to fit simultaneously models that have some kind of evolutionary mechanism and dynamic, and then use those to make inferences about ecological structure in the present. So I think it's a really exciting time to be working in ecophylogenetics. I'm also very lucky in that uh, I have a collaborator, Matt Helmus, who has this fantastic data set that he and colleagues have, uh, many colleagues, who many of you I'm sure are very aware of, um, have generated data on the distributions and traits of uh, annals in the, sort of the, the area of the Caribbean. And uh, I've just taken this sort of data here from, from uh, Matt Helmus's 2014 paper, which is incredible. I definitely suggest you all read it. Um, and what's amazing about that paper is he's got so many different islands and so many different distributions, and he's got the phylogenies and the traits of those, those lizards. And he's using that to try and make some sort of inference about biogeographical processes and how things are assembling. So what I thought would be nice to do would be to try and take some of these new ecophylogenetic methods that I've just sort of briefly washed over there. I'm going to go through in a bit more detail now and try and use those to try and understand how it is that different uh, lizards end up in different islands and what we might be able to tell about the evolution of those traits given where those lizards are distributed today. So specifically, the kinds of questions I'm interested in answering, or at least trying to answer in this talk, are what drives animal distributions? Is it something to do with the elevation, um, the, some aspect of like the habitat of each of these islands? Is it something to do with the traits of these animals? And the thing I'm going to focus on is body length, simply because, as I know very little about these lizards, that's the one thing I sort of, on some level, understand length. It sort of makes a bit of intuitive sense to me. And then finally, try and sort of take that kind of information at the present day, and as I say, try to understand how those traits and the interaction of species traits with their environment might have evolved. So that's a bit of an overview to sort of what I'm trying to do here. So I'm trying to generate some new... There's a camera that's just appeared... Um, I'm trying to uh, generate some information about new kinds of ecophylogenetic methods and try and say something about anoles. And I emphasise I'm not an anole expert, so I'm, I'm very happy to be corrected on the details of them. So starting off with these kind of existing techniques, how can we use phylogenetic generalised linear mixed models to understand something about the uh, trait and environment interactions in anoles? So first, an overview of PGLMM, because I just think they're fantastic. So it's a phylogenetic generalised linear mixed model. So what does that mean? It means some very scary-looking maths. But don't worry, everyone, I promised you, no maths, no maths. You don't need to understand. You just need to understand coloured boxes. So it's a generalised linear model, which means that we can model the probability of species being present, ones and zeros, as if it were continuous data. It also incorporates some aspect of species traits, right? So we can say, OK, my, my lizard is particularly long. What does, what does this mean for how it's distributed in space or through time? We can also measure some aspect of the environment that we might find uh, species within. Okay, so you can say this, this particular community of some sort is particularly high elevation or particularly warm, particularly cold, whatever. And then finally we have some aspect that measures the evolution of species. And this is the, the complicated bit, and that's where the mixed bit comes into it, because this is measured through random effect terms in a mixed effects model. What you can say is you can say, OK, is it the case that these traits that these species are assembling in space and time through, have they evolved in a conserved manner? Is it the case that these traits are kind of 
non-random samples as a consequence of uh, phylogenetic shared history among species. What you can also do is you can fit models where you say, okay, have the responses of species using those traits to that environment, has that evolved? And you can transform, essentially, this kind of random effect term in such a way that you can test different models of how you think species uh, trait evolution might have played out. And what do you end up with if you start doing things where you say, okay, what's going on with sort of elevation and what's going on with species traits? Is you start plotting things where you say, okay, I can look across all these islands and I record all the grid cells where species are, are absent. And I record all of the ones where the species are present. And I plot that for the trait of a species as a function of whether that, spe that species is particularly short and particularly long. And perhaps the best thing you could say about this graph is that it is colorblind friendly. Um, so, <laughs> So here we have, I've kind of jitted these things here, as I say, just points indicating where species are absent from a particular cell and where they're present. And there's nothing tremendously inspiring going on in this graph. What it's showing you is just that we fit a model to data, and it tends to be that longer species are in more grid cells in, uh, in, in the Caribbean data set we're looking at here. What's nice about PGLM M, is it lets you fit statistical models that test these associations. So going in, I thought there was going to be an association between body length and between elevation. That was what I was told to look for. But of course, the PGLMM is just a slightly more fancy linear model. And so you can fit analyses and you can test for interactions. And this is the minimum adequate model, or whatever you want to call it, that I've got out of my data. And we can map all of the different things that I was showing you earlier onto a PGLMM. So here you can see average length, that's the trait of the species. I looked for an interaction with the elevation. I didn't find it. And elevation is a part of the environment there as well. And then critically, in the yellow there, the orange, if you will, really, I suppose, um, I've fitted some random effect terms that account for the evolution of, of these species, looking to see if I can see conservation in terms of species body size. And what was interesting to me is because you can also test the significance of these things, I did not find significance in those terms, which to me was tremendously surprising. I was expecting to find a good degree of phylogenetic inertia in this. And I should emphasize this is totally preliminary, so maybe I just sort of messed something up. So what this is telling me is that I have this PGLMM framework that is, I think, reasonably complex, and it fits our data reasonably well, but it's still not capturing every aspect of it. And so I wanted to think about whether there is a way that we could maybe fit something that's a bit more mechanistic that might help me look at the evolution of these sorts of traits. So to summarize what I've just shown you, I've just shown you how you can use a phylogenetic generalized linear mixed model, PGLMM, to look at trait and environment interactions, determining species co-occurrences and distributions, and now you can look at that within an evolutionary framework. What I now want to talk about very briefly are some models that I've been trying to develop that might help get it a bit more mechanism, that might help me understand why it is that I can't find an effect of phylogeny even when I know that there really should be one, or at least I really hope that there will be one. And so to that end, I've been trying to incorporate um, some ecological dynamics into models of evolution. And I've been focusing on what I think are the two main things that, to my mind, models of macroevolutionary biology are currently missing that I think we really need. The first one, oh my word, that really has gone a bit odd, hasn't it? Um, right, let's, let's go with this one. The first one, then, is um, when we talk about macroevolution and we talk about diversification, I think a thing that is often missing is a concept of environmental filtering. The idea that you might have species with particular traits, be it that they, they're orange or that they're yellow, and that whether a species is orange or yellow might map in some way onto the environment it finds itself in. So perhaps if you're a yellow individual and you find yourself in a very orange environment, you don't do it very well. But if you're an orange individual in the same environment, you do. And this is the kind of environmental filtering, I think, to an ecologist is fairly sort of, seems reasonably plausible if ridiculously simple. Um, but to macroevolutionary biologists, it's very difficult to implement. Secondly, I think uh, something that I would like to sort of call ecological speciation, which is the idea that if you've got a species that has a lot of intraspecific trait variation, that is, it's occupying a very wide sort of area of niche space, you might argue, it has more potential to radiate out into different, and to speciate, to split into different species. And I'm sure many of you can imagine this is the sort of thing that I really might imagine to be important in an animal data set. The problem and the reason we haven't been able to fit these kinds of mechanisms and models, I would argue, in macroevolutionary biology is because it is very hard to write a likelihood function for something like this. St and statistically, that just means the maths is very hard, or at least that's the extent to which I understand the mathematical problem. But if you go into an approximate Bayesian computational technique, you don't have that problem anymore. All you have to be able to do is you have to be able to get some data. That's the really hard bit, frankly. 
We then have to simulate under some model that you specify, be that ridiculously complex or whatever, and then you get a sort of a posterior distribution of kind of like simulations that you then define some sort of summary metric that defines whether or not you think your simulation did a very good job or not. And then you start the whole process over and over again. You keep going, you keep going, you keep picking new parameter combinations until eventually you have a distribution of things that according to a metric that you've defined, you say is done very well. So there's a lot of circularity in there, and it's an ABC approach, it's a bit funny, but whatever. But I, I think it's a really good way of getting at some of these mechanisms and models that I think could potentially be really important in data sets that we care about. So for tractability, I took, to fit this kind of intensive computational approach, I took all of this data and I've tried it on a few of the islands, but I want to focus on just one island, because it was a bit more tractable to do. My laptop is only so big, so I wanted to focus on one of them. And so I turned this very high resolution set of data here into this sort of pixelated blob, okay? So we've got blue here for islands, we've got areas where we have no data as well, and we have green here which represents the island itself. And each of these grid cells has an elevation within it that I'm using to try and model the evolution of things across it. And if you're sort of looking at this right now and you're thinking this doesn't look like a tremendously accurate depiction of an island, um, Donald Trump uh, got in contact with me recently and said that many people are saying what a great approximation this is to an island. So there we go. I just really wanted to put a picture of Donald Trump up in front of a room. I just really, what a lovely man. Anyway, so um, when I tell a lot of kind of pop gen people, the people that I'm trying to apply ABC methods in community ecology, they tell me that's all very well and good, but the problem with ABC is it's just a big smoothing process and uh, that you never know when an approximate Bayesian computational approach has succeeded and when it has failed. So what I have on the left here is, this is just one particular summary metric, and I want this metric to be round about zero. Okay, so this is a sample from that posterior distribution that I was showing before, and this is from a sample I was fitting it to a plant data set in Barrow, Colorado Island. And so as you can see, in this case, it's worked very well. The model has worked perfectly, I would argue. Here is the red line, it should be on the red line, sort of roughly centered on the red line. That was in a data set where my model worked very well. This is what the ANOL data set looks like on exactly the same scale. So all of the data should be there. These are the posterior measures. So what I've learned from this fitting exercise is I very deliberately wrote a model that I thought would fit ANOL data very well because it would enable me to look at uh, adaptive radiation and kind of ecological speciation. And it didn't fit at all. And I have no idea why. So to summarize, that is a method, however, that I think could be really quite tremendously important because it's getting at mechanism for the first time. It's that I think, for me, it's one of the first times that we've incorporated a macroevolutionary model that incorporates some kind of community ecological dynamics that we might care about. So even if it didn't work in this case, I think there are somewhere it might, and I think it'd be interesting to find them. So where from here? If you've enjoyed when I was talking about phylogenetic generalized linear mixed models, this paper here by Andrew Tanznap is amazing. He implements them in a Bayesian framework and it's really flexible and really wonderful. Please go and read that paper, it's absolutely incredible. Also, some person with a fantastic hairdo um, has implemented uh, a PGMM implementation in an R package called PEZ. Um, it is not as nice as the Bayesian implementation because of course it's not Bayesian and Bayesian lets you do lots of other things. So there are two ways here that you can implement uh, a kind of a PGLMM. And also within PEZ, if you are interested in these kind of ABC approaches, you can do the simulation model that I described here with the kind of the ecological speciation in a function called sim.meta.com.fi. And then finally, if these sorts of things have seemed interesting to you, um, I'm, hire, I'm trying to hire a postdoc right now to look at exactly these sorts of things to kind of develop these new kind of macroevolutionary and community ecology e models. So if you're interested in that, please do talk to me at the end. And so with that, I just need to say thank you very much to the wonderful people who collected all of this data, to Jonathan Davies and Pedro perez Nato, who I, I worked with quite closely at one time when, when I was implementing this, this ABC stuff, and of course my, my um, co-author Matt Helmers, and all of you for listening. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks Will. Um, any questions? Thank you. 
so that's a fantastic question. So if, if the way I hear your question is, so what about the fact that they're kind of colonizing these islands in sequence and then they radiate out once they're there? So that was what motivated me in one sense to focus on one island as well, because I was hoping by doing that I would kind of enable myself to cheat and get around that. I think the reason that these models aren't picking up classical phylogenetic signal is exactly what you're saying. There's an adaptive radiation going on. And so I think actually the solution to the problem is to try and model the system as a whole. So to, to, to allow the kind of the ecological speciation parameter to have its effect, because it's enabled to sort of, when you're on a new island and there's nothing else there, then that kind of, kind of soak up like that. So my, my hope is that actually by modeling the entire island as a whole, that will kind of allow the model to more naturally account for that. But you know, at, at this point, it, it's very hard to run it on a single island. So I, I don't know whether I will be able to get it to run on all of them same time. But that's a, that's a fantastic point. Thank you. Do you include it in the uh, random effect? Uh, random effect in the PGLMM? Yeah. Uh, so yes, I tried that. The problem with them is uh, that I, I couldn't get it to converge. So that could mean many things. <laughs> I think we'll stop there. It's uh, 12 o'clock. And uh, I'd just like to thank Will and all of our speakers and all of you guys for attending this session.